on the dotted line. Let Philadelphia freedom ring and patriotic voices sing. Red, white, blue, never give up. You represent America. some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. The French still fear a war with Great Britain, and without France as an ally, the light on our success will dim even more. The rebels are deserting General Washington's army like rats from a sinking ship. Why should France risk war with Britain to help a struggling band of rebels? We need proof from General Washington that he can defeat the British. She's all ready to print. Good. I'll be seeing you. Oh. <laughs> Hold your horses there, Henri. But there's a ball tonight at Mayor Powell's mansion. Funny. I don't recall you receiving an invitation. Why let a little thing like that stop me? Good evening, one and all. How's Sarah? On her way to visit Abigail Adams in the bustling city of Boston. Lucky girl. I wish I had a family I could visit. Sorry, we're closed for business. But I need to place an advertisement. Oh, no. I spent three hours setting that type. I would not change it for General Washington himself. As a matter of fact, I've been sent here by General Washington. Here's the advertisement he gave me. Captain Alexander Hamilton of the New York Company of Artillery, by applying to the printer of this paper, may hear something to his advantage. 24 words. That will be a one pound sterling, payable in advance. What my junior apprentice means to say is that we'd be honored to run this at no charge to the general. Thank you. I'm very much obliged. Our pleasure. Now this sounds like a mystery. Henri, we'll have to reset the type for the entire page. But what about the ball and all those beautiful ladies? They'll just have to dance without you. Welcome to Paris, Dr. Franklin. Silas Dean, my old friend, good to see you again. How goes your mission to win support from France? Not well, Ben, not well at all. What's all that about? Some sort of celebration? Take a look out your window. Ben Franklin's the most famous man in Europe. Well, I'll be. It is so good to be back in Boston to visit Mrs. Adams, but the city does seem so very changed. Sarah, it's so good to see you again. Is something the matter? The smallpox has returned to Boston. I wanted to write you to tell you not to come, but there was no way to reach you in time. How are you and the children? All fine for now. But perhaps you should return to Philadelphia. I wouldn't think of it. Pox or no pox, I wish to stay with you. It's easy, really. You bow and take the lady's hand like this. Then you twirl her and... <gasps> Excusez-moi. I'd like to speak to the proprietor of this newspaper. Then you'll have to go to Paris, France. This advertisement. 
what does it mean that I may hear something to my advantage? You're Captain Alexander Hamilton. That's right. That advertisement was placed by General Washington himself. Well, not personally by him, but on his behalf. The Continental Army's in Campton Morristown. That's where the general is. Then that's where I'll have to go. Would you like some company? I've been meaning to find out how the Continental Army's holding up for the winter. That is, if a gentleman such as you doesn't mind riding with someone like me. It would be a pleasure. I'm staying at the inn at the far end of the street. We'll leave first thing tomorrow. This is going to be a great story. I've got to get ready. Now, about those dance steps. Wouldn't you like to impress the ladies? The only thing being impressed around here is some wood. In your arms, for the stove. Now, where were we, Silas? You were about to tell me whether you have any good news from America. Sadly, I do not. Ben, I've worked tirelessly to convince the French government that ours is a cause worth helping. But it's been months since I've heard from Congress. And all this time, Lord Stormont, the British ambassador, fills the court at Versailles with rumors that our rebellion will soon be crushed. We must keep our faith in General Washington. There's something else you need to know. I've secured four large ships loaded with arms and uniforms for our troops. But now, Comte de Bergen, France's foreign minister, has issued an order to prevent them from sailing. What are we to do? Excuse me, I didn't mean to intrude. Edward Bancroft, we last saw each other in England, as I recall. I took your advice, Ben, and hired Edward as my personal secretary. He's the only man in Paris I trust. I wish I had better tidings, Doctor, but King Louis refuses to grant you an audience. Little strokes fell to great oaks. I shall take the strategy of attacking these problems one at a time. What do you intend to do first? Finish my bath, then enjoy a hot meal. After that, I'll meet Comte de Vergen. That will buy us some time. Such a meeting might be very difficult to arrange. Not for the most popular man in Europe. Who's that you're holding, John Quincy? General Washington. These are my children, and I'll do anything to help them. Mrs. Adams, you'd be making a terrible mistake. I'll be back in a moment, children. I would not be doing my duty as a doctor if I did not warn you against the dangers of inoculation against smallpox. But how could inoculation be worse than the disease itself? It is a new idea, barely understood and quite risky. Those who favor it say that it will give you a milder form of the pox and prevent the most deadly type of infection. But I have seen the inoculation itself cause great illness, even death. First, you and your children must ingest mercury, a poison to your system. You must fast and purge for days. Then, when you are weak and your blood is thin, you must brave the infection itself. It's simply too dangerous. But Mr. Adams underwent the inoculation and survived. He told me the smallpox is ten times more dangerous than the British. All the more reason to avoid the chance of having your children contracted through inoculation. Mrs. Adams, let me go first. I know I'm not a member of your family, but perhaps the children will draw strength from my example. With good weather, we should reach Morristown by the end of the week. And then I will have to face General Washington and explain how my artillery company has been reduced to a mere handful of tired, hungry, sick men. It's a good thing General Washington seems to favor true gentlemen like you. <laughs> What's so funny? I'm no aristocrat, nor ever was. I was born in Nevis in the Caribbean Sea. My father abandoned us, and my mother died penniless before I was 13. I lost my own parents as well. If it weren't for Ben Franklin's help, well, I don't know where I'd be. Mighty oaks from tiny acorns grow, eh, James? I sensed a kinship between us from the very start. We will enjoy this ride, we gentlemen of low birth.
General Howe has assured me personally that the rebellion will be over by spring. The rebels are deserting General Washington's army like, forgive the expression, rats from a sinking ship. I even have it on good authority that this Benjamin Franklin fellow fled the colonies in such haste because he was caught stealing from the American treasury. Merci beaucoup, Lord Stormont. You may be assured I will convey this news to His Royal Highness, King Louis. On behalf of the British Crown, I would be most... Good evening. <gasps> I don't believe it. Oui, are they? Sacre bleu. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> Côte de Virgin, Ben Franklin at your service. Dr. Franklin, what a surprise. Welcome to Versailles. A man of my years is happy to be welcomed anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Permit me to introduce Lord Stormont. He was just telling us that you left America under rather hurried circumstances. It was merely a rumor. Though I am but a humble man, I do know this. The truth is one thing, Stormont is another. <laughs> Touché, Dr. Franklin. Let us talk privately for a moment, Doctor. I will come directly to the point. I am the foreign minister of the most powerful nation in Europe. Why should France risk war with Britain to help a poor, struggling band of rebels? Because our cause is the cause of all mankind. We are fighting for your liberty when we defend our own. A lofty sentiment, I am sure, though I don't think King Louis would think very highly of it. Then tell His Majesty this. The new United States control immense wealth through trade, trade that could be redirected to France under the right circumstances. It's no secret France and Britain are on the verge of war, but we can treat each other like families. If yours were to help ours now, we would surely help yours later. And what would you like my French family to do right now? Release Mr. Dean's four ships. Let them sail to America to replenish the Continental Army. And that is all? I told you I was humble. We shall see, Dr. Franklin. Are you all right, Sarah? Should we go inside? No, the fresh air is good for me. I do believe the inoculation is working. I received another letter from my John today. Congress has returned to Philadelphia. He so wishes he could be here with us. It must feel good to read his letters. Sometimes I close my eyes and imagine him there in the room with me. Have you heard from your father? Not for a very long time. He will write you, I am sure. And then I will close my eyes and imagine him beside me. <coughs> Sarah? <coughs> Sarah, are you all right? <sighs> Sarah! Her pulse is beginning to race and her fever is rising. What about you and your children? Charles is quite ill, but nothing like Sarah. Does she have family close by? None, I suppose, but us. Tend to her closely. With God's blessing, her fever will break. Without it... are bad all over. Little food, not enough shelter for the soldiers, let alone their families. And smallpox. I've seen the signs of it before. This isn't what I expected after our victories at Trenton and Princeton. The conditions of war care little for victory or defeat. I found out General Washington staying at Arnold's Tavern by the town's green. I suppose the moment of truth has arrived. <laughs> You've made quite an impression, Ben. I understand that because of you, the French have coined a new word for telling a lie. Stormontaire. The poor fellow asked for it. And your likeness is being sold all over France. The rumor at Versailles is you've made King Louis jealous with your popularity. The last thing I want is to offend another king. 
Comte de Brigène's secretary is here and requests an audience. By all means, show him in. That's enough for today, Jacques. Merci. Dr. Franklin, Count de Virgin wishes you to have these. Tell me it's good news. Virgin still won't let your ship sail, but he stands ready to advance three million livres to us if we keep it under the strictest secrecy. But why not let free the ships? Because the French still fear a war with Great Britain. My attempt to bluff the French has worked well so far. Now we need proof from General Washington that he can defeat the British. Keeping this secret will be very difficult. There are British spies everywhere. I don't like this, Ben. We need those ships. Patience, my friend. We'll stick to my plan until good news arrives. I've gotten them all, and as I've read them, I've watched you grow into a strong young woman. Do you really mean that? I'm not worried about you now, Sarah. I love you, Father. There's a clearing up ahead. Look. Come with me. We'll go together. I've been in France now well over a month and enjoy a surprising celebrity that I have endeavored to use to our advantage. What I lack, however, is any word from Congress on the fate of our new United States. Is there any good news at all? Without it, I fear France will soon call my bluff. And without France as an ally, the light on our success will dim even more. Gentlemen, Martha has asked me to apologize for the meager quality of our surroundings. I know you're all used to much finer accommodations. Now, what do we have here? <clears throat> Captain Alexander Hamilton of the New York Company of Artillery at your service. Yes, Captain Hamilton. I take it you saw my advertisement. Yes, sir, Your Excellency. And if it isn't young James, how goes the newspaper business? Couldn't be better, General. Now that you've shown General Howe a thing or two. Hmm. Captain Hamilton, we must talk. If this is about the men in the artillery company, Your Excellency, I can explain. Captains and kings need never explain anything. That was fine work your men did at Princeton. Thank you, Your Excellency. Captain Hamilton, I placed that advertisement because I would like you to join the Continental Army and serve as one of my aides de camp. I don't know what to say. That is... I would prefer to fight on the field of battle, Your Excellency. I understand your desire, but your gifts are needed here, now. Have you a family, Captain? None to speak of, sir. Then you will find one here. Martha and I look upon each man at this table as our own kin. And I assure you, your colleagues will look upon you as a brother. Gentlemen, may I present the newest member of our family, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> Yes? Ben, mail has arrived from America, and the news is good. Washington's won surprise victories at both Trenton and Princeton. I told you, my friend, that one must have faith in General Washington. Dr. Franklin, Mr. Dean, Comte de Virgin just had this delivered. 
Jen congratulates his American family on news of their notable victories. He's lifted the order blocking your ships. They're free to sail to America. You did it, Ben. You outbluffed the English long enough for good news to arrive. This is one letter I'm happy I won't have to send. Mrs. Adams? The fever's broken. I was so afraid we were going to lose you. I was so far away. And then, I know this sounds odd, my father helped me back. Everything will be all right now. Soon, General Washington will have the whole army inoculated. Can you imagine a world without smallpox? I'm afraid my imagination is not quite so vivid. It's the kind of scientific progress Dr. Franklin always talks about. Perhaps you should take the inoculation yourself. Would General Washington let me? Spring will be here before we know it, and he's going to need every strong man he can find, even those who write for newspapers. Good luck to you, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton. It's not official yet, but thank you anyway. Well, I had better find His Excellency. You can't imagine how many letters he has us write. Here are some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. To serve the General means everything to me. General Washington, little French pet. Running around camp, looking for something to do. You must prove yourself in the field before I can give you men to command. Courage, friends! To fight! To win! Freedom! the bright flash of lightning speed down the string straight toward me. Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Monsieur Foreign Minister. I'm afraid I have distressing news. A French nobleman has defied the king's orders and sailed to America to join General Washington. Our cause stirs hearts even in France. I am pleased. King Louis is not. Since France must remain neutral in this conflict, he requests a tiny favor. Write to your Congress and tell them they must not welcome this man. And this man's name is? The Marquis de Lafayette. Little boy, where may we find the Continental Congress? I am not a little boy. <gasps> you are French, countryman. Hmm, my apologies, mon ami. I meant no insult. Who do I have the honor of addressing? Henri Richard Maurice de Trois Lefebvre. But a fellow Frenchman may call me Henri. I am Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Jobert de Mortier. The Marquis de Lafayette. You may call me Jobert. Hurry, you two. We must get the paper out in an hour. May we help you? Henri, you said you would take us to the Continental Congress. I said I could take you to the Continental Congress. Welcome to Benjamin Franklin's print shop. This is my friend, Jobert, Marquis de Lafayette. 
We are here to join the great General Washington in the quest for glory and liberty. I'm Moses, and this is Sarah and James. My dear friend, Johann Kalb, known to his German countrymen as the Baron de Kalb. A Baron and a Marquis? Yeah, we're so impressed. Ow! Forgive me, but we must to Congress immediately. To get our commissions. Yes, and we have much work to do. What's a commission? A letter that says you're an officer in the army. Au revoir, my friends. Glory, liberty, and General Washington await. I just saw General Washington, and I don't think he's waiting for you. No. You know General Washington? Of course. Hmm. Washington is famed all over Europe. To serve the general means everything to me. Marquis, please, stay a moment and tell us of your trip here. There is nothing to tell, and I must go. Nothing to tell? He dressed as a woman to sneak out of France. I was wearing a merchant's cloak. Joubert, do you have children? Yes, Henri, I do. Two daughters. So you need a son to live with you in your mansion. I need a guide to bring me to Congress. Oh, Moment, mon ami. I must thank you for your expert guidance. Keep them safe. They were my father's. Merci beaucoup! Our letter of introduction. Is genuine. But, gentlemen, if we issued a commission to every man with a letter from Mr. Dean, I fear our army would have more officers than foot soldiers. Mr. Hancock, we have gone through much hardship to join General Washington in the glorious fight for liberté. I sympathize, Monsieur Marquis, but Congress must do what it thinks best in order to win that fight. It took us months to get here. We oui, months! Mr. Hancock, I would be honored if you would permit me to try to convince you of our dedication to the cause of liberté. Merci. In France, as everywhere else, noblemen are concerned only for themselves. When I learned of the American cause, I knew I had finally found kindred spirits. I bought my ship, La Victoire, the Victory, with my own money. A great deal of my own money. We sailed to Spain to meet up with more volunteers. While there, I received orders from King Louis demanding I return to Paris. Why do you have such sympathy for these Americans? They suffer from taxation, without representation, and unfair governance. What's wrong with that? Um... <laughs> I was joking. It's because they're fighting our bitter enemies, the English. Very good, Marquis. But you cannot go. If the king approved your plan, Britain would declare war on us. And that cannot happen at this time. Understood? What I understood was that King Louis secretly approved of my plan, but the minister could not say so. I determined to sail for America and glory immediately. That night, properly disguised... Dressed as a woman! <laughs> I was wearing a merchant's cloak. Whatever you say, my friend. Thank you. I sneaked back to La Victoire, and we set sail for America. 
Whoa! But our navigator's calculations were incorrect, and we landed miles from our target. Still, delighted to finally reach these blessed shells, I prepared for a warm welcome. Happily, we identified ourselves as French and not British, so our ship was not burned. The townspeople invited us into their homes, outfitted us with horses, and sent us to make a rendezvous with La Guerre and La Liberté. And six weeks later, we are here in Congress, humbly offering our services to yourself, General Washington, and your countrymen. Most entertaining, sir. We thank you deeply for your interest and hope your journey back to France will be safe and speedy. I don't understand why Congress would not want brave, intelligent noblemen to join General Washington. Not that I want you fighting my countrymen. It is an outrage! Joubert, you must go where a man such as you is appreciated! To France! And I will go with you to fight for liberté, live in your mansion, and have gold buttons on all my shirts. Hmm. I will serve General Washington, and I will risk everything I have to do so. Rats. You will help me with my English, please? Of course. After the sacrifices I have made in this cause, I have the right to ask two favors at your hands. One is to serve without pay at my own expense. The other, that I be allowed to serve at first as a volunteer in the ranks. Gentlemen, we need people like this. Dedicated people willing to sacrifice all for the cause of freedom. Yeah! Congress has resolved that the Marquis de Lafayette's services be accepted and that he have rank and commission of Major General in the Army of the United States. Please give our regards to General Washington. Very quiet today, Sarah. Lafayette is a nobleman of great wealth. He has so much to lose, and he's willing to sacrifice all of it for his beliefs. I wonder if I could do the same. Freedom's worth more than anything, Sarah. Trust me, I know. It is not every day one meets one's hero. Don't worry, and I can point him out for you. Thank you, Henri. But I will recognize him at once by the majesty of his face and figure. Marquis, relax. He treats his people like family. He's a fine and generous man. <laughs> I dread this, Mr. Hamilton. These preening foreigners here to play at war. Many of our men refuse to serve under them, and no wonder. They seek only glory, with no understanding of that for which we fight. General, it is the greatest pleasure of my life to meet you. The pleasure is mine, General. Thank you for coming so far to join our cause. My aide-de-camp, Alexander Hamilton. The Marquis de Lafayette. Ben Franklin's boys, it's good to see you again. Thank you, General. I must apologize, sir. I am afraid you will find our troops greatly inferior to those of your own country. General, please. I am here to learn, not to preach. And in many ways, I feel like this is my country. The happiness of all humanity is deeply bound up with the happiness of Americans. I bring to you my sincerity and my goodwill, no ambition or selfish interest. 
It is my deepest hope that this new land will become a cherished and safe asylum of virtue, of tolerance, of equality, and of peaceful liberty. And finally, I sneaked out wearing a wig and a dress. <laughs> you must tell me more, my dear Marquis. I am ready. Patience, Jobert. As dear as I hold you, you must prove yourself in the field before I can give you men to command. Forgive me, General, but... Then how may I serve our cause? My friend, I am certain opportunities will present themselves. The food gets worse by the day, but that's tougher to stomach. General Washington, little French pet. Running around camp looking for something to do. Huh? Bon appétit, my good man. Mm. Mm. This reminds me of the most delicious roast venison I ever ate. And this roll, oh, mm. Mm. reminds me of my sweet wife back home. Sheer heaven. You, sir, what have you there? I dreaded dinner till I imagined it was my favorite meal. What is your favorite meal? Well, my mother made the best chicken and dumplings I ever ate. Then have a bite, my friend, and remember your good mother. Get away from that water. It's dangerous. I can't wait to see Gilbert. We're here to report on the army, not bother him. If Gilbert could hand over these buttons to me, imagine the treasures he must have at home. Washington is one of the richest men in Virginia. Hancock is the richest in New England. If we lose this war, they lose everything. What's more important to them, treasure or freedom? <gasps> Red coats. We shall have to retreat to keep our army intact. But General, Philadelphia... ...will be lost, I'm afraid. Sir, the loss of our capital will be a blow to the country's morale. It will, but the city is of no military value. And the loss of our army would mean the loss of everything we're fighting for. We must keep the army intact to fight another day when we have the advantage. The men at our center are beginning to panic. If we don't retreat in an orderly fashion, we will be destroyed. Bounce 
the red gods can't hit the broad side of a barn. <laughs> If we panic, we are lost. Help me maintain order. I am counting on you. Fall back. Soldier, help us cover the retreat. Courage, friends. We will have our day next time. To fight, to win. Freedom, freedom! Look, they're getting out. The army's saved! Joubert! Can you see Joubert? I can't see him! Oh, Joubert, please be all right! Joubert! It appears the British have welcomed me to America with a musket ball in the leg. The doctors will look at it immediately. Perhaps later, General. The men! The men are fine. The army will survive to fight another day. Don't move. Surgeon! This is my personal surgeon. Treat him as if he were my son. Lafayette has joined the Continental Army. Congress never got the letter King Louis asked you to write. That's because he asked me to write the letter, not send it. <gasps> I believe Monsieur Lafayette will become a popular sensation here in France, and thereby help the king see the wisdom of signing a treaty with our new nation. I must thank Ben Franklin for founding this hospital. Henri, where are my father's buttons? I sold them and gave the money to the hospital. Are you angry with me, Joubert? I'm as proud of you as if you were my son. I think maybe now we can both call ourselves Americans. Here are some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. I believe in being what you want to be, not what people tell you to be. The British have begun moving back to Manhattan. We absolutely must evacuate Fort Washington. The armaments at the fort are critical to our cause. We're in a war, Joe. We're bound to lose men if you haven't the stomach for it. Get another job. Keep firing. If we can't hold this position, you won't have the Corbins to blame. Jams, and jams, and more jams! Oh, and rock candy! Moses and I will stop while you're in France. <laughs> Those sweets are to ease the discomfort of a long voyage. If you try to ship out with our peach jam, you'll have to get past me first. Congress won't be happy if you delay their most important statesman. They would understand if they knew how good this jam tastes. You're probably right. But they have asked Dr. Franklin to try to enlist France in the American cause. Right now, we Americans stand alone in the world. We must acquire allies, or the revolution is doomed. Promise me he'll bring back some French pastries. worried about him. After his last voyage, he swore he'd never cross the Atlantic again. Seventy is very, very old. At his age and in his health, who knows if he'll survive the trip. There!
Who's it from? Sarah and James. Would you like to read it, Henri? I couldn't possibly read through the tears in my eyes. Tears from seeing all this food for the last time. I hope it's good news. If I'm to convince France to help us, we have to show that we can gain a victory against the British on our own. Hmm. What's wrong? Washington is retreating from Manhattan. Dear Mother, please forgive the irritable nature of my letter, but I'm tired and thirsty. Oh, oh. And the men in these colonies suffer from a decided lack of gallantry. In addition, since I'm not a man, General Washington told me I couldn't stay at the front lines. He sent me to a place called Fort Trial. Here! It can't be much of a fort, as I'm about to join a group of camp followers, women and children who live here with their soldiers. I'd certainly rather be viewing the action with the General and James than be here watching people wash clothes. Thank you, sir. Mm. Nice little stroll, huh? Huh? I'm Margaret Corbin. My friends call me Molly. Who are you? Thank you. I'm Sarah Phillips. It's good. Of course it is. The dirt from the river adds flavor. Oh. I've been General Washington's secretary for months now, and I've never seen him so discouraged. All we need is a victory, and I know the general will deliver it. He's the most decisive, commanding man I've ever met. Lieutenant Harrison, I need you now. Commanding is right. English is not even my language. This here talk funny, and I can't learn to read. Who says this? Other boys. Let me tell you something, Henri. It's a credo I live by. Be what you want to be, not what people tell you you can be. Well, then stop telling me I can be a reader. What I want to be is left alone. You owe it to yourself to hone your reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'm doing just fine without it. Yes, you've done well so far. You've learned a trade at a second language, and I'd like to help you keep learning. Why? For one thing, if you could improve your skills at estimation, we might not be short logs for the fire, and we wouldn't both be freezing our toes off. At least we're not outside. Do you think Sarah and James are all right out in the wilderness? Rosemary, stop wiping your nose on my dress. <laughs> Ouch! This is ridiculous. I'm out in the middle of Fort Nowhere fishing for trousers. You're not the only one who didn't want to come here. Oh, <laughs> hello, Molly. After my husband John enlisted, he was about to leave our place in Pennsylvania. Know what it's like to be a woman living alone in the wilderness? I'm sure I don't. In that wild country, I wouldn't even have been able to feed myself. Hey, Maul, what's for supper? Some kind of shirt soup? Better than raw squirrel or whatever it is you got stuck in your beard. <laughs> ah, you leg puller. Raw squirrel. It's probably raccoon. It's amazing the way you keep your optimism in a place like this. Deary, when I was five, my daddy was killed and my mama kidnapped. I never saw her again. If that didn't ruin my life, I'm sure not gonna let this do it. <laughs> Who's your friend, Ma? Sarah. She's English. Well, we won't hold that against her. This is John. He's a matras. Cleans and loads the cannons. I'm mighty proud of him. One reason I don't mind working so hard. We can't have the man loading the cannon wear dirty drawers, can we? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of cannons are they? Pennsylvania six-pounders. Right up there on the brow of that hill. We protect the northern approach to Fort Washington. And those beauties will make things plenty tough on the lobster backs. I beg your pardon for the slight, Sarah. 
Never mind. I quite understand. Ignore him. John just doesn't like red. Sure am lucky he married me. Don't let her fool you, Sarah. I'm lucky she married me. It's not like I had lots of choices. It was either him or Squirrel Beard over there. It's Raccoon! <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Franklin, the only thing you'll catch with a line that thick is influenza. <laughs> I think I've already got that. Actually, at the other end of the line is a thermometer to measure the water temperature. Now save you the trouble. It's cold. I study the ocean currents and temperatures every time I cross the Atlantic. It was these studies that helped me chart the Gulf Stream seven years ago. Just don't let your studies interfere with your health. It's my job to get you to France alive. How are you feeling? I'm not sleeping well in these rough seas, and the food, particularly the salt beef, is tough on 70-year-old teeth. But the fresh air seems to do me some good. However, I'd prefer to avoid the frequent baths. Gentlemen, I have surprising news. The British have begun moving back to Manhattan. I suspect they're mobilizing to attack Fort Washington. Our last stronghold in Manhattan. It houses some of our finest troops and a large amount of our armaments and ammunition. This fort and its outposts are critically important to the war for both sides. Sarah's at one of those outposts. Yes, your friend who wanted to see action is about to get her wish. She's the best artillery mate in the whole regiment. I can't believe you're permitted to do such a thing. I don't ask permission to do nothing. I believe in being what you want to be, not what people tell you to be. I know someone else who shares your point of view. I can't read the recipe. I'm starved to death. <gasps> Who is there? Henri? Moses, is that you? What's wrong, lad? Nothing's wrong. Come on, son, tell me. When you didn't come back, I tried to make dinner from the notes you left me, but I couldn't measure. Oh, you're teasing me now. And there's lots of words I don't understand. Hey, you're the one who's teasing me. Oh, you were late on purpose. You knew I wouldn't be able to make myself food. I could have starved. Somehow, I think you wouldn't have starved. But reading and measuring are important things to know. Have you changed your mind about learning them? Yes. Even if other fellows don't think I can. But not right away. Why not? Because I'm too hungry! First, a late supper. Then, a late lesson. We absolutely must evacuate Fort Washington. The armaments at the fort are critical to our cause. America has no munitions factories. We've no way to replace the guns and ammunition if they're captured. General Washington, I strongly disagree with Colonel Reed. I'm confident we can hold the fort. If we can hold it, we should hold it. Sir, General Green would risk over 2,000 of our finest troops. We've already lost too many to disease and desertion. I don't have the stomach to lose anymore. We're in a war, Joe. We're bound to lose men if you haven't the stomach for it. Get another job. 
I stand by my recommendation to hold the fort. General Green's right. We must fight. Um, excuse me. Sirs. Sir, this hesitation to evacuate is nothing short of reckless. Forgive me, but you must make up your mind. It's only November. How much colder does it get here? Much. That's why when John's tour of duty is up, we're moving south. Then we'll start a family. Oh. How many children do you want? Mm, I don't know. Eight, ten. Oh, my. John's a good man. He'll make a fine father. Probably a tired one, too. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my family terribly. But being around people like you makes my stay here so much easier. Here now. I'll make it easier still. I like to press the summer flowers. They always add a bit of cheer when winter comes knocking. It still has its perfume. General Washington, sir, we need a decision now. Do we abandon Fort Washington or do we defend it? General Green, as you are the officer most familiar with the situation, I leave it to you to give such orders as to defending Mount Washington as you judge best. I appreciate your confidence in me, sir. So, General Howe demands that I surrender this fort over to you British. Please repeat the following to your commander. Give me leave to assure his excellency that, inspired by the most glorious cause that mankind ever fought in, I am determined to defend this post to the last man. I would expect nothing else from a soldier of Colonel McGaw's reputation. That will be all. Gentlemen, I am resolved to crush the rebels into dust. Even a single victory could give their so-called revolution momentum on the battlefield as well as support from foreign shores. Especially France. Look at all the redcoats. They're preparing for an attack. And we won't have long to wait either. See there? Hessian troops to the north. Hessian mercenaries. I can't believe the king is paying Germans to come here and kill British colonists. Washington's not going to evacuate the fort after all, is he? He's worried that it may not be as strong as we think. He wants to inspect it in person. Why does he keep changing his mind? The British have begun their attack! Like it or not, we have lost our opportunity to evacuate the fort. With this six-pounder, we might be able to hold off the Hessians. But not the King's Navy! You won't have the Corvins to blame! Oh no! Molly, no! Oh. I'm alright, Sarah. God help us!
For Tryon has fallen. There's nothing we can do for those poor souls. Please let Sarah be all right. General! They're raising the Union Jack over Fort Washington! That's it, then. General Howe has prevailed. This is a most unfortunate affair and has given me great mortification, as we have lost not only 2,000 men, but a good deal of artillery and some of the best arms we had. Sir, the men panicked. I did not account for the possibility if we had but held the perimeter. No, sir. We should have abandoned the fort as General Lee and I urged. Gentlemen, please. I alone am to blame. I've never seen him look so disappointed, so helpless. He is in danger of becoming a parody of a general. I pray Colonel Reed is wrong. What happened to Fort Tryon? To Sarah? Women and children will be returned to us. This may be war, James, but there are rules. What's that? I think it's... Yes, it is! The camp followers from Fort Tryon! continue the fight after this. It's hopeless. Nothing's hopeless. Not when people like Molly fight on when all seems lost. If all the colonists display her spirit, America will be very difficult to defeat. Will your friend be all right? Yes, you can't keep the Corbins down. I learned an important lesson today, Mr. Harrison. As much as I respect my generals and consider them my family, never again will I make a decision that goes against my own instincts. A disaster like this battle must never happen again. We must prevail in our fight for freedom. We will prevail in our fight for freedom. Maybe with the spirit of George Washington. And Captain Molly, and Ben Franklin, and so many others. All isn't lost after all. Here are some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. We need an official declaration to fix the people to our cause. The Hessians have arrived. General Washington said that there are 18,000 troops. The time for talk is past. It's time to act. We must all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. June 1776. Dearest Mother, In the last Congress, some of the delegates believed Dr. Franklin and Mr. John Adams were plotting treason against the King. However, this Congress hasn't a single delegate still loyal to the Crown.
James and Henri have journeyed to New York, where James hopes to interview General Washington for the Gazette. Provisions are every bit as low as morale, to answer your question bluntly. Provisions, morale, blunt. Ugh, not so hard. Oh, sorry. You're with the Pennsylvania Gazette, aren't you? We've met before in Philadelphia and Boston. Perhaps you can answer a question for me. What in the world is going on at the State House? From what I understand, long, drawn-out arguments. We need an official declaration to fix the people to our cause. The publication of Common Sense changed many men's minds in our favor, but it's time for Congress to act, to exploit public opinion. We need a complete united front. See for yourself. Here. Who are they? Hessians. Hess what? German soldiers. There's hundreds of them. And more on the way. King George III has made a deal with German princes to hire 18,000 troops. But General Washington, you'll be outnumbered. What will you do? There is very little we can do against the British and the Hessians, not without help from Congress. But what can Congress do? They can issue a proclamation of independence. Then the French government may be persuaded to send troops to help us face this onslaught. We've got to get back home to tell Dr. Franklin about this. Excuse me, but we need our horse right away. What's your hurry? We have to tell Dr. Franklin about the Hessians. You mean Ben Franklin? We have to tell Dr. Franklin so that Congress can get the French to help us. Henri? Well, in that case, I'll get right on it. Hey, let me go! Watch out, Henri, they're Tories! Get the boy. They want to warn Franklin about their new troops. <laughs> Never mind him. Let's lock this one in the barn. What is it, lad? James! He's been taken prisoner by the blacksmith and some men. Who is James? He's my friend. We have to go tell Dr. Franklin the Hessians are here so Congress can help. And these men want to stop us. Tories. They have him in there. <clears throat> Let's force it open. What are you doing? That's my stable. We're looking for a boy. Nothing in there but horses. What did you do to him? What is this little fellow yammering on about? You can't do that. He just did. That's private property. And that's a human being. James! And you're a Tory kidnapper. You can't do anything to me. I don't know what I can ever do to repay you. I do. Get your horse and ride like the wind to tell Dr. Franklin the news. We need some help from Congress. Dr. Franklin! Dr. Franklin! Dory's got James! The Hessians have arrived! She wouldn't let him out! Good heavens. They tried to stop us. General Washington said that there are 18,000 troops. They locked James up in a barn. Hessians locked you in a barn? Are you trying to worry us to death? Henri saved my life. You look a fright. That blacksmith was a Tory. He didn't want us to bring the news to Dr. Franklin. I shan't let you out of my sight for fear of the trouble you find. Start over, James. What did the Tories not want you to tell me? King George has sent 18,000 troops. The Hessians. We saw them arrive. General Washington wants Congress to... Yes, I know. A resolution on independence. We must try harder to get Congress moving or we'll be finding Hessians in our beds. The 
chair recognizes Richard Henry Lee of Virginia. Mr. President, I would offer three resolutions. That the colonies are in fact free and independent states absolved of all allegiance to Great Britain, that the independent states seek to form foreign alliances, and that the independent states establish a plan of confederation. I second all three resolves. Order in the chambers. Order. He's done it. Lee of Virginia. What a headline that's going to make. What an act of treason against the king. Treason? Your king has sent German troops to attack us. I want to hear too. Henri, be careful. Ah! <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Dickinson, I'm with the Pennsylvania Gazette. How nice for you. What are the hopes for passing the independence resolution? Few and far between. Independence is dangerous and impossible. Could you explain that answer, sir? Dangerous because without the protection of the crown, the frontier will fall to the Indians. And a European power more ruthless than England will gain ownership of the colonies. Impossible because only New England and the South want independence. The middle colonies, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania will never vote for it. But Thomas Paine's common sense has changed a lot of people's minds. Common sense is anything but. And just as Mr. John Dickinson tried to infer that Paine's common sense is a waste of time... I don't think infer is the word you want to use. Yes, it is. She's right. Well, it sounds good. Words have a great power, James. I know. I'm a journalist. You have to be more careful in choosing them. What would be the right word? Suggest? Doesn't sound as good. But it communicates your meaning. Even with the right word, this article's no good. I don't know whether Congress is going to adopt the resolution. Dr. Franklin is having a secret meeting upstairs about just that subject. So it is our job to come up with a written statement of independence on which Congress is to vote. So you'd better start working on it, John. Not me, Franklin. My shrill insistence and lack of tact have made me too obnoxious. If the others know it's my hand on the pen, they'll tear it to shreds. Whom do you propose to write it? You, Dr. Franklin. You are the most famous writer on the continent. I pass. I write for the amusement of my readers and myself. I will not write something only to have a Congress rewrite it. What about Roger Sherman or Robert Livingston? They're on the committee as well. They can barely write their names. Jefferson, you have a fine mind and a gift for language. Me? You. It will be an honor to turn what talents I have to this cause. I only hope I prove worthy. Ah! <gasps> <laughs> Where's Mr. Jefferson going in such a hurry? He's got a lot of writing to do. <sighs> Drat! Have to do better than that. Go away! Just want to ask him some questions. He's too busy working. Working on what? I think I know a way to find out. How? Never mind. Just wait for me back at the print shop. Go away! Chambermaid? Oh, all right. Let yourself in. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to destroy the... When in the course of human events, it becomes imperative to cut asunder the... When in the course of human events, it becomes desirable for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another... <gasps> it's sedition. He's writing an explanation for... Breaking off all ties to the crown. Finally, a declaration of independence. 
But why does he keep starting over? Why not just write it and have done? Remember what I said about the power of words? But doesn't he know that action is needed now? It is important to take the necessary time to choose the correct words. Especially when defying a king. And do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Yes! Order! The chair recognizes John Dickinson of Pennsylvania. James, look! Those men need help! We don't have time. We're already late for the reading of the declaration. And this rain doesn't help. But they'll get soaked. So will we. Look, that one man has a collar. He's a man of God. We're stopping. All right. Need some help? Bless you, lad. What we need is transportation to the State House. Hop in. That's just where we're headed. Peace and prosperity would be the benefits of independence. Unlike my esteemed colleague, Mr. Dickinson, I have nothing but contempt for the present situation and nothing but hope for the... We've been detained by the elements. Order! Please explain this interruption. I'm the Reverend John Witherspoon, and we are the newly elected New Jersey delegation. We've been instructed by the New Jersey Provincial Convention to support the resolution for independence. This is a most welcome interruption. Are we late for the vote? Thank heavens, no. Thank the heavens, indeed. But thank these young people. Without their help, we might have missed it. I can't thank you enough. We are happy to have been of service. Can we stay and watch? Please, take the seats behind mine. But you must not tell anyone what is said here. All in favor? All opposed. That was only a straw vote to see where we stand. Well, only Delaware and Pennsylvania stand against the independence resolution. But in order to adopt it, the vote must be unanimous. The actual vote will take place tomorrow morning. Until then, we are dismissed. Rat! If only Caesar Rodney of Delaware were here, he'd vote with us and bring Delaware to our side. Caesar Rodney is bedridden. Wait a minute. James, could you and Moses race to Delaware to visit a sick friend? <laughs> if it's thieves, I'm alone. You'll only have me to rob. <laughs> We're not robbers. Ah, uh, then you've come to escort me to the next world. No, just Philadelphia. That's a far cry from heaven. Dr. Franklin sent us. With news of the independence resolution? The vote is tomorrow, and your vote is very important. Help me out of bed, gentlemen. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better if you rode in the carriage with us? Speed is everything. <laughs> Thanks again, fellows. <laughs> <laughs> that cough sounds bad. We'd better try to keep up with him. I don't understand why he wouldn't let us take it. Now you've seen a real hero. <laughs> Betty, Rod.
ładny. I've got to make it inside. As I believe the voice of my constituents and of all sensible and honest men is in favor of independence, my own judgment concurs with them. I vote for independence. It's unanimous. The resolution on independence passes. He made it. You got the yes vote for Pennsylvania? Mr. Dickinson saw the inevitability of our cause and stayed home. At last, America is independent. Mark my words, this day, July 2nd, will be remembered as the most revered day in American history, an occasion for games, sports, bells, bonfires, and illumination. In accordance with the wishes of the delegates, let us now debate Mr. Jefferson's declaration. Debate what? The time for talk is past. It's time to act. The bonfires and illuminations may have to wait, John. The Congress wants to quibble over the words. But you're cutting my document to pieces. I count 30 deletions and changes so far. More than a quarter of the length is gone. Your pride is understandable, Mr. Jefferson. You have written a magnificent document. But it's vital for us to be united as we take this drastic step. The chair recognizes Mr. Rutledge of South Carolina. Why do they have to cut the life out of the Declaration? It's fine as it is. It goes back to what I've said before, the power of words. They are choosing a set of words for which men will surely fight and die. Great care must be taken. There, a signature big enough for King George to see it all the way from London. Dr. Franklin? We must all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And there you have it, men, our Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. Independence! Freedom! Oh! It's amazing! That one document can have this effect on tired, dispirited soldiers. This is madness! Where will it end? In independence? If the purpose of the Declaration is to gain popular support for the cause of independence, it looks like it's working. This will make it easier for the United States of America to appeal to the French for military support. I have to admit it, Sarah. 
You and Mr. Jefferson have taught me a lesson I'll never forget about the power of words. Independence! Freedom! Here are some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. The British are preparing for a large-scale foray into the South. My plan is to hit him when and where he's not expecting us, then run like the wind before he can catch us. He'll have to take new supplies from the local population. They will despise him for that. Then the people in the South will move over to our cause, and Cornwallis will withdraw. I hope if we don't stop Cornwallis there, he will drive north and crush Virginia. General Green, being appointed to command the Southern Army is quite an honor. Honor is an interesting word for it, James. The Southern Army is exhausted, and the British have a great deal of support in the South. We must rally the population here to our side, or we could lose the war. My greatest hope is that the governor of Virginia will provide me with much-needed men and supplies. My greatest hope is that he'll provide us with some much-needed Southern desserts. And I'm looking forward to writing a story about the man who wrote the words, All men are created equal. <laughs> the governor's mansion. Just think, in a few minutes, I'll be talking with Thomas Jefferson. <gasps> How do you address the author of the Declaration of Independence? Your Excellency. No too formal. Mr. Jefferson. No too familiar. I hope we get to see him soon. I can't take much more of this. She looks kind of like a chicken trying to dance in sticky mud. Sir, great to see you again. Ah, oh, that's better. The governor will see you now. Sir, great to see you again. Sir, great to see you again. Sir, great to see you again. We met before, in Philadelphia, you remember? Oh, maybe you don't. I was disguised as a chambermaid and I stole some of your trash. Well, I didn't really steal it. After all, it was trash and I was just doing some investigative reporting. And I was investigating you. No, that's not right. I was just trying to find out what goes on in that brilliant mind of yours. Anyway, hello. James, tell me that wasn't perfectly awful. It was better than I could have ever hoped. Forgive me. I was jotting down a thought about developing free schools that all our nation's children could attend. A pleasure, General. So great to see you again. Whoa! <laughs> And you must be Henri. Henri Richard Maurice Dutois Lefebvre, from France. Yum! So, how may I be of help to you, General? Governor Jefferson, the British are preparing for a large-scale foray into the South. I'm not surprised. Most Southerners are country folk whose main concern is earning their daily bread. They don't care which side they're on in the war. Quite so. Here's the situation we face. This half of the desk is the Carolinas. This half, Virginia. You're here. The traitor, Benedict Arnold, is off the coast. And Cornwallis holds strong British positions at Georgetown, Camden, Winsboro, and 96. Oh, yes, and here is the small force Horatio Gates has left me. 
force I have not yet had the pleasure of seeing. I will take my forces to the Carolinas. If we don't stop Cornwallis there, he will drive north and crush Virginia. Governor, I'll need Virginia militiamen and weapons if I'm to have any chance of preventing Cornwallis from winning the South. I evened things out. Now it's a fair fight. <laughs> Yours is a difficult position, General. I will help you the moment I can, but right now I have no weapons to give you, and all my militiamen have served their required time and gone home. I'm afraid I can be of no help, General Green. I'm sorry. Soldiers can be asked to serve additional time, but cannot be forced to do so. The idea of a people's army is unfathomable. I admire what Governor Jefferson is saying, sir. Giving men the right to choose whether they will or will not fight sounds to me like freedom. But we're in a war, Sarah. We won't have any freedom if we have no soldiers. You do have a point, James. General, I hope you are successful in North Carolina. And James, Henri, I'll keep you up on events here in Virginia. In the meantime, I plan to find out how Thomas Jefferson found the inspiration to write the Declaration of Independence. I hope you don't end up as disappointed in Governor Jefferson as I am. Be well, Sarah. Soldiers! Uh, are they British? No, probably some leftover Virginia militia. <laughs> I am General Nathaniel Green. Who's your commanding officer? General Horatio Gates, sir. At least he used to be. This is the Continental Army? With these soldiers and without Jefferson's militia, we're no match for the British. <laughs> You're full of good questions, Sarah. Yes, I think we should educate everyone. Men, women, even slaves. And how exactly would you do it? Ah, there's the problem. Having ideas and implementing them are two very different things. Are they really? I mean... The stores are in place. The firewood has been cut. Your home is secure for the winter, Master. Thank you, Great George. I'll need Tuckahoe secured as well. And let me give you some letters for my wife and daughter. Excuse me, Sarah. We'll talk more later. Being governor takes a great deal of time for my family. Fortunately, I have help in remaining in contact with them. Help? You own other human beings and you refer to them as help? You own slaves! You, the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, is what I wanted to say, but I didn't have the nerve. And by the way, Governor Jefferson is still unable to raise any militiamen to send to General Green. As always, Sarah. Have you noticed that every week it gets harder to tell what's in the soup? Hmm, we've got the usual bear fat, uh, but this batch looks to have beaver tail and muskrat. That can't be beaver tail. It's got a tooth in it. A tooth? I'm not eating this. That's a first, but don't complain to the cook. Poor guy has to make meals out of anything he can catch. There's only one way we can even hope to beat Cornwallis. <laughs> beat Cornwallis? Half the men aren't well enough to walk. Shh, come on. My plan is to hit him when and where he's not expecting us, then run like the wind before he can catch us. Chasing us will force Cornwallis to use up all his supplies. He'll have to take new supplies from the local population. They will despise him for that. Then the people in the South will move over to our cause, and Cornwallis will withdraw. I hope. That's his plan? Where's that coming from? We're under attack! Dear 
Dear Sarah, I don't know if General Green's plan to get the British to chase us all over the Carolinas is helping us win the hearts and minds of the population, but I sure am getting to see a lot of the country. I do hope, though, that Thomas Jefferson can convince his militia to reinforce us before we get to see much more of it. But Sarah, how are you? Have you finished your interview with Thomas Jefferson? I can't wait to read it. No, James. What can I possibly ask him that wouldn't be horribly disrespectful? Governor, would you please tell your slaves about how all men are created equal? And on top of it all, Benedict Arnold is attacking from the north. Oh. Oh. That traitor. James, we are forced to evacuate Richmond. Sir, the British are nearing the city, 1,500 strong. What of our militia? Of the 4,600 men you called up, only 200 have reported. That means Arnold will march into Richmond unopposed. I never thought the traitor would make it all the way to Richmond. We must speed up our evacuation. Over there, the tree! Seek cover! Follow him! Not under the trees! We've got to get these men out of the rain. They could get struck by lightning. The trees attract it. It is what gave Benjamin Franklin his idea for the lightning rod. I'll yield to Dr. Franklin's science. Away from the trees! We'll try that barn over there. Let's go! Halt! We heard you are coming, General. Get off my land. Shelter from the rain, sir. That's all we require. I want nothing to do with your insurrection. You and your men, keep moving. We'll take his barn whether he likes it or not. Take it! Take it! Take it! Halt! You heard the man. We'll continue up the road. Move out! Always running from the enemy is working. That's because you don't understand General Green's brilliant tactics. At least this is an army now. An army people might join. An army that can't feed its soldiers or keep them dry? Oh, sure, I join that army. We have to put our faith in General Green. General Cornwallis, sir. All signs indicate that the enemy passed through here only hours ago. I told you burning our wagons and excess baggage would speed us up. Yes, sir, but it's also left us woefully short of food. There's a farm ahead. We'll take what we need. <laughs> no, stop! You can't do that! I... Ah! No! <laughs> Madam, your husband would do well to cooperate. Carry on! We're loyalists! We've never supported the fight against England. If you take our stock, how are we to eat? We are at war, my good woman. The King's soldiers come first. I have every confidence you will survive this inconvenience. Move out! I'm all right. I'm all right. Did 
Dear James and Henri, the British have withdrawn to Portsmouth and we are returning to Richmond. Prior to our evacuation, Governor Jefferson had finally made some progress toward convincing the Virginia legislature to provide men and supplies for General Greene. Now he must start all over. And as for my interview with the governor, it will instead be an expose revealing his awful hypocrisy on the issue of slavery. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, Sarah. James, are we ever going to eat tonight? I found some hickory nuts, a hunk of ox jerky, and, uh, well, I think this was a squirrel. Get that thing out of here. Eggs, that was hard to find. Is food all you ever think about? I was just... There's more to this war than filling your belly. I'm sorry, James. Wait, Henri, I'm sorry. It's not you. I just found out there are still no reinforcements coming from Virginia. So the army's gonna have to keep running. Just like in New York and New Jersey, just like in Philadelphia, just like they've been doing for the whole war. General Green says if we make it across the Dan River tomorrow, the running might be over. So what? You were right. His plan's not working. It's not winning anyone over to our cause. What am I supposed to tell the people who read our newspaper? Tell them, tell them our forces are so thin that uh, General Green does not want to risk their lives in an uneven fight. And tell them that the food in the South is not what it's cracked up to be, unless they like squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on! Hold on! I need to get my men across the river, and quickly. If the British catch us here, we'll be destroyed. Where are the fords? <laughs> fords? Yes, the best places to cross the river. Use your eyes, Colonel. The river's in front! Then I'll need your boats. Is that so? British or Continentals, you boys are all the same. Think you can take whatever you want? Well, I know you're not gonna send my boats back. That just be giving the Redcoats a way to cross the river. So, you're gonna have to pay for them before you can take them. That's only fair. I'll make you a trade. You will? I'll give you 20 horses for your boats. Good ones. Why am I just watching? This is a great story. The Southern Army owes you a debt of gratitude, sir. Thank you. General, I was neutral in this war, but from now on, consider me a, uh, uh, what are we calling ourselves these days? Revolutionaries? Sons of Liberty? Just Americans. Maybe we'll win their hearts and minds after all. American! I'm an American! disappointed that the legislature has once again refused my call for more militia, but I can't say I'm surprised. If you need men, sir, what about learning from the British? You could promise freedom to slaves who will fight for America. I might support it, but the Virginia legislature never will. The state's economy is dependent upon slavery. Is the economy as important as the fact that all men are created equal? No, Sarah, it isn't nearly as important. But Governor Jefferson, you own slaves. Yes, but I have proclaimed slavery an abomination that must be brought to an end. Proclaimed? 
With respect, sir, proclaiming isn't doing. This is a young country, Sarah. Still locked in a battle for its own survival. There are countless issues to be addressed, limitless problems to be solved. Slavery is one of the biggest. And Sarah, we will solve it. Do you view me and my colleagues as great men? Yes, sir, I do. Well, we are great. Great with human flaws, as well as human hopes. I doubt there's a man among us great enough to see the horror of slavery eliminated in our lifetime. I've tried, and I will keep trying. And if we cannot correct this abomination, then those who follow us shall. Take courage in that. Governor Jefferson, I must confess. I've been writing an expose about you and your slave for Dr. Franklin's Gazette. But now, after listening to you, I don't think I'll publish it. I commend your passion, Sarah. When the war ends, I intend to draft a plan for freeing all the slaves in this country. I'd welcome your thoughts on the subject. Governor Jefferson, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Here are some exciting scenes from today's episode of Liberty's Kids. Now that Lord Cornwallis has joined Benedict Arnold, I am not even strong enough to get beaten. Gentlemen, our fleet has finally arrived nearby at Chesapeake Bay. It will carry our troops to a position from which we will crush the rebels once and for all. We must have information. What about your spy, McKee? The one who helped you almost capture Arnold? This slave could make defeating the rebels significantly easier. I have always thought that one person of ability may accomplish great things for the world if he first forms a solid plan. And then passionately devotes himself to following it through. Is it James? Master, do you believe in freedom? You know I do. I'm a patriot. I believe in this new country. General Lafayette left here only yesterday. I would like your permission to join him. Then I'll come back if I survive. Hmm. All right, James. You may offer your services to the general. Thank you, sir. I'm much obliged. Without a navy, we can do nothing decisive. With it, everything honorable and glorious. General Washington, when do you think the French fleet will get here? I expect General Rochambeau knows when Admiral de Grasse will grace us with his company, but our good ally is not saved. If the ships would arrive, we could take New York and end this war. The French haven't even come through with support for Lafayette, one of their own. Yes, General Knox. The poor Marquis races through the Virginia heat with barely 1,200 hungry men, trying to stop that traitor from burning more homes to the ground. Benedict Arnold. Pillaging my state. If only Lafayette could capture that traitor. I want the traitor. I want Arnold alive to face the justice he deserves. I would like to face General Arnold too to ask him if he no longer believes all his lofty words about freedom. But we are powerless, running like rabbits from place to place. Where are our French troops, our ships? Ships? Ships sail on water. Water is cold. Please don't mention cold, Jobert. It reminds me how hot I am. Write this to Washington, please. Your Excellency. 
now that Lord Cornwallis has joined Benedict Arnold here in Virginia, I am not even strong enough to get beaten. Ah. I must find other means with which to fight. I remain supremely confident of our ultimate victory. But sir, I am running out of men, supplies, and ideas. <laughs> Henri, you're in the presence of a general. And a lady. Get dressed. <gasps> general, there's a Negro here who wishes to join us. Bring him in. Who are you, my friend? James, sir. What is your last name, James? My master's name is Amistad, so that is my name, too. How do you think you can serve our cause, James Armistead? What are your skills? Sir, I am invisible. Huh? I'm a black man. Most white folk don't look at me. They don't think about me. They don't care about me. They don't fear me. Do you have any use for an invisible man? This horrible southern heat. If General Clinton had heeded my advice and permitted me to crush Washington in the north, His Excellency would be a prisoner, and I wouldn't be in Virginia sweating like some beast of burden. General Arnold, sir, you ordered me to bring you any Negroes offering service? Ah, yes, in return for their freedom. They value freedom above all else. That is why Negroes can be relied on. Bring them in. How long have you lived in this area? All my life, sir. You know your way around, even in the dark? Yes, sir. You will serve me as my guide. First, clean my coat. And I do hope you have a talent for killing mosquitoes. Lieutenant, I shall not wish to be disturbed tonight. Now and then, I enjoy being alone with the trees, the crickets, and the frogs. I find it my sole opportunity these days for contentment and calm. If and only if there is a matter of extreme urgency, you will find me by the pond, just outside the northeast end of camp, relaxing. Find the spy in our camp, and you will hang him. So we almost captured Arnold, all because of James Armistead? We, oui, Henri. Perhaps James is the secret weapon we've been lacking. Henri, I told you to put on your clothes. We. Oui. Good morning, sir. Three more desertions last night. It's this heat, Lieutenant. Our troops are from colder climates. I had hoped that seeing me wearing full uniform would inspire them. Joubert, didn't you tell me there used to be warriors who fought naked? You, Henri Lefebvre, are not a warrior. Hmm. Now Clinton calls me North. At least I can meet Washington in his foolish campaign to retake New York. Sir. I'd like to continue to serve, sir. Please don't send me back to slavery. General Cornwallis has arrived here in Petersburg. His lordship can always use another servant. The man doesn't even like to buckle his own shoes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm much obliged. 
An ambush! Captain Wayne, we wouldn't have lost any of your brave men at James River if we had intelligence of Cornwallis's plans. Thanks for the lightweight uniforms, sir. You are welcome. And now these rumors Cornwallis will be moving. But where? When? Must have sent you back a lot of money, sir. It was my pleasure. Worth every penny to get you into something other than your underwear. We must have information. What about your spy, McKee? The one who helped you almost capture Arnold. We have not heard from James Armistead in two months. It is my hope he has not been able to get a message out. It is my fear that he is dead or has run away. I ask the spies, sir, do you have any last words? Yes, sir, he answered. But if I told them to you, they wouldn't be mine anymore. <laughs> <laughs> More pie. Ooh. Hmm. Now I shall tell you my news, which is not to travel outside this tent. Gentlemen, our fleet has finally arrived nearby at Chesapeake Bay. It will carry our troops to a position from which we will crush the rebels once and for all. We do not yet have orders as to where that position will be. Thank you, gentlemen, and good night. What's your name? James, sir. James, I wish to have a word with you about something quite grave. Yes, sir? I wish to talk to you about spying. Lafayette had me write a letter to Washington for him. He told His Excellency he's devilish afraid of General Cornwallis. He's just trying to get Washington to send help. Joubert's not afraid of anything. Who's that? James Armistead! James! James? Sir, General Cornwallis knows I am a spy. Then how is it, James, that you are still alive? I am a spy for General Cornwallis. Cornwallis thinks you are working for him? James, you are brilliant! <laughs> Cornwallis is expecting General Clinton to send some of the British fleet to the Chesapeake Bay with troops and supplies. But where will these ships take the British troops, mon ami? If Cornwallis knows, he is insane. And he's careful with his maps and papers. But I'll find out, sir. I swear I'll find out. You be careful, James. Now that Lord Cornwallis thinks you are spying for the British, you are in more danger than ever. It's only fair that I give you a chance to change your mind and never again return to the English camp. No one will think any less of you, my brave friend.
I'll need some phony papers to give Cornwallis. You shall have them. But not quite yet. And now that we have finally received the orders containing our army's real destination, you, James, shall take these orders to Lafayette with a false destination to lead him astray. Tell him you took them for my pocket when I was drunk. Yes, sir. You shall have your freedom and more. You Negroes take care of me, and I shall take care of you. James, is tea ready? Another minute, sir. Then, Lieutenant, let us enjoy 60 seconds of fresh Virginia air. This slave could make defeating the rebels significantly easier. Ah, it's lovely outside. Now, Lieutenant, we must use this particular spy very carefully. Don't you feel like taking some air, too? I'll watch things here. doing? Simply the best crumpets I'd ever eaten. <clears throat> I can only imagine the astonishment on my face. Please, I know you'd be rewarded, but delicacy in front of this please don't say anything. Please. I desperately wish I'd demanded the recipe from the man, but I was so surprised, I simply didn't think of it. I hope, Lieutenant, that our forces do not similarly squander such a splendid opportunity. Excellent. Cornwallis will move to near Yorktown here, where he'll wait for the British fleet to arrive in Chesapeake Bay. When his ships arrive, he will attack us. Washington must know of this immediately. James? How did you learn this? I was very nearly caught, General. I would have been put to death for treason if not for an African soldier fighting for the British. A man named Cato. Cato? Isn't that the name of Moses' brother? Yes, certainement! Cato! We must find out if it is Moses' brother. James, please don't put yourself at any more risk. But if it's possible to find out, it would mean so much to both of them. I owe the man at least that. General Rochambeau lied to me. Our French fleet is headed for Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, not for New York as Rochambeau promised. My plan to take New York is ruined, but... This might provide us with the opportunity we've been waiting for. We know Cornwallis is at Chesapeake Bay, sir. Yes, General Knox, at Yorktown. Admiral de Grasse will have 29 warships and 3,000 troops. Here, our army and Rochambeau could march south and join Lafayette on the other side of Yorktown. Here, we would then be surrounding the British by land and by sea. So the army marches south, it could be the huge victory we've been hoping for. Yes, James, it would certainly lead to a great victory or a devastating defeat. Hmm. The risk would indeed be grave. What if the march to Virginia in the heat decimates our troops? What if the French ships never reach Chesapeake Bay and leave us without naval support? What if we arrive here and the British fleet evacuates Cornwallis' forces? And worst of all, what if Cornwallis leaves before we even arrive in Virginia? News of very great importance is on the way. In the meantime, my dear Marquis, it is of the most critical importance that, at all costs, you prevent Cornwallis from leaving Yorktown. How can we hold Lord Cornwallis in Yorktown with so few men? Sarah, please write back to His Excellency. 
I hope you will find we have taken the best precautions to lessen his lordship's chances of escape. Yes, sir. Is there any more, whatever this is? These plans you recovered were clearly intended for a large new rebel force on its way here. To reinforce Lafayette. Fine work, James. So we shall indeed remain here at Yorktown until our fleet arrives. I want you to gather my senior officers back here in 20 minutes. <clears throat> Cato. What? Do you have kin named Moses? Moses? My brother! James, what do you think about during your long walks between our camp and Yorktown? The petition of James. A slave belonging to William Armistead. That your petitioner, convinced of the just right which all mankind have to freedom, even though he was a slave, did during the ravages of Lord Cornwallis through the state of Virginia, enter into the service of the Marquis Lafayette. That he often, at the peril of his life, conveyed messages from the Marquis into the enemy lines of the most secret and important kind the possession of which, if discovered on him, would have certainly endangered his life. That for this duty, he should be set free, and his master paid for the loss of a valuable workman. Yes. Freedom, Sarah. Freedom. Freedom.